Thank you. This was my, that was the most rehearsed part of this presentation. So welcome to Blender by the Numbers. I tried to do this five years ago, and then there was some technical glitch. Let's see what happens today. Um, I love the numbers, and uh, I, find, uh, I find it very interesting to, uh, you know, to observe and measure the different dimensions and the shapes that uh, a project like Blender takes. And the numbers, or metrics, uh, they are a good way to, uh, to make this more tangible. And uh, as part of the, year, uh, the Blender you know, Foundation yearly reports, I've been collecting and analyzing some numbers, and uh, I'm going to share some of them here, uh, along with a few others. And before we get into it, um, I want to talk a bit about the mental model uh, that we use to, uh, when we approach this. So what data do we have available? And, uh, uh, you know, how do we... Wait. Yes, sorry, you see the, the rehearsal part I was saying. Um, so we have like website traffic, download count, donations, activity streams. So there is lots of raw data that we, that we work with. And um, how do we collect it? We use uh, analytics tools, uh, we parse system logs, and we use other platforms. And um, this is an example. This is how an uh, aggregated uh, log looks like. And uh, um, you can see like the, the, the flow of requests that come into the website, and then all these things that can be then analyzed and shoveled into uh, analytics tools to make some sense of that. And uh, we collect data only from willing users, minus what we can get from the system. So for example, if you make a request to a server, the server logs that request. So that's something that we can work with. Or we collect it from people that are willingly submitting it. So for example, the open data platform with the Blender benchmark is a system where people can send their data over, and uh, uh, then we can uh, display it and show it. So for example, the website collects around 200 submissions per day. And uh, it is useful for uh, computing, like you know, having an idea of how certain uh, uh, CPU or GPU architectures work across Blender releases and so on. And uh, talking about analysis, like you know, looking at the data itself, we use analytics dashboards uh, with uh, you know page views, events, and things like that. We parse the logs with tools like Grafana, and we write our own little scripts and tools. Uh, this is an example of an analytics uh, dashboard for uh, Blender.org. And uh, this is an example of a dashboard that aggregates data from the projects.blender.org website. And uh, uh, why do we do this to begin with? And we do it to spot trends, um, to check the impact of our communication, and to make issues visible to the community of contributors, and also to make it possible to uh, communicate the purpose and the impact that the Blender project has to people. So, for example, as part of my work with industry relations, and I, I approach, for example, organizations or uh, organizations that are interested in sponsoring or supporting the Blender project, explaining the impact and the size of Blender, this kind of data is very important to show how relevant Blender is. And as you will see, there is like plenty of information to look into. So uh, it, it's important to also ask ourselves the right questions when you approach uh, these problems. So we can have some pretty obvious ones, like you know, how does the website convert visits to downloads? Or how does it convert visits to donations? And uh, so we can start with websites. And uh, you know, looking at the traffic on the Blender website over the past 30 days, uh, you observe the distribution of the traffic among the different domains. Um, so out of the total 80 million visitors, more than half visit docs.blender.org, the documentation platform, and uh, 6 million go to blender.org, and share 1 million each, they go to the studio website and the extensions platform. And uh, these are, those were visits, these are actual page views, so like it's the 30 million per month page views, it's almost double. It means people are uh, obviously clicking more than one page when they visit the Blender website, which is good. Maybe there is something interesting there. But then uh, if we go one level deeper, we can actually see a thing which are called requests. So this uh, may or may not result in a page view, somebody asking something to the website. And this is also for the past 30 days. 
So I was looking at this, I noticed something. Uh, so in average, you see, we have like 10 million of these uh, requests every day. And then all of a sudden, something happened, and we got like 100 million requests. It's very exciting. So which website? Oh, download the Blender.org. Oh, very cool. So but what in particular? So the Blender source code and Blender 4.2.2. So that's like 10 years worth of all the Blender downloads in two days. So that's very successful. So this is how a cyber attack looks like. So that's a DDoS. <laughs> And it gets uh, then mitigated. So this is not an actual request, unfortunately. Um, this, instead, speaking of, uh, so this is like how the AI crawlers are interactive in the Blender website. And so you can see uh, how the ChatGPT is learning about Blender, and the Amazon bot is learning about Blender. Many millions of requests coming in. And that's like what makes then those LLMs so powerful and aware of what is going on. Um, this is instead like a dashboard that shows the uh, Blender website is a more high-level tool uh, showing for also like the, you know, uh, one day of traffic, worth of traffic, how it's distributed uh, with our European time 3 p.m. peak, which is when some of Europe is still awake, some of the U.S. is also awake. A lot of people go to the downloads page, so we have like almost 100,000 visitors, if you don't think of people with uh, ad blockers. Um, and more than half of them goes to the download page, which is great. Um, out of these 100,000 people, actually, it's very interesting because like almost 3,000, so almost 3%, actually comes from Blender. So when you click on the manual or like when you click on some link inside of Blender to open the website, we check, uh, we attach something to the URL, and that shows that a little bit of traffic actually comes from within Blender itself directly uh, into the Blender website. And um, looking at the distribution uh, of the countries, US is still like pretty big, but uh, I've been seeing for the past few years that uh, countries like India, China, and Russia, they have all grown up a lot in the ranks of the uh, website, the countries that give a lot of traffic to the Blender website. And um, browser distribution is just like, I mean, in case there was any doubt about who is uh, the you know, most popular uh, browser around. And uh, out of those 100,000, you remember, the 100,000 in a day, uh, around 60,000 they download Blender in a day. So that's what you can call a conversion rate of 50%. So that's pretty good. I mean, for Blender, it doesn't really mean a lot because the conversion rate for marketing is very important because you're selling a product, right? In the case of Blender, it's like people go on the Blender website for all sorts of reasons. So there is around one download every three seconds of Blender. So since we started talking, a bunch of people have downloaded Blender. What are they doing with it? I don't know. <laughs> um, and over time, these numbers, they pile up. So this goes back to 2019, when Blender started to become actually popular. So then you can really see that from a you know, less than 10 million now is going upwards and is kicking up to the uh, almost the 20. And uh, you can see it is divided by uh, sources. So we have the Blender.org website, and uh, we have Steam and the Windows Store. There are a couple of others, but they are like so small currently that they are not really easy to measure at this scale. So Blender.org is still today like the place where people go get Blender. And uh, when it comes to the operating system distribution and the popularity, this is also uh, something that is slowly, slowly changing. But uh, Windows is, of course, like almost 80% uh, of the amount of uh, uh, downloads that we, that we get. And the thing that I find the most fascinating about Windows is that the majority of people actually download the installer. So Blender comes with, a, uh, obviously, a, uh, an executable you can just download, double click, and run. And it's very quick and easy to do. But because people are so accustomed to get a download wizard and click 100 times to install the software, they choose they really explicitly choose to, to get that. And uh, it's just something that I find fascinating. Um, speaking about donations, which is kind of the other question that we were having, right? How does donation conversion work? How does it work? So this is like a breakdown of, the, uh, some, of the, some of the money that comes in. So we have uh, membership and one-time donations uh, at the top and the one-time donations at the bottom. Um, the chart is very tiny, barely readable. And you can see that there are some peaks. So this is over the period of one year. And uh, towards the left, uh, so the end of last year, you see a big peak. That's when we did the 
birthday campaign for Blender. And then it stabilized and it went back to its normal levels because during the, uh, the donation campaign there was a lot of traffic and so uh, we, we put a lot of advertising and a lot of communication. Um, and then at some point in July, you see the, <laughs> there is a, another little bump going up. We tweaked a little bit our messaging and we made it even more prominent uh, that, you know, to invite people to donate to Blender and we uh, reduced to a minimum the amount of advertising of the Blender Studio uh, offering on the Blender Door website. We used to have banners to advertise products and training and so on and, and we were like, okay, what if we make it 100% about donate to Blender? It's the only thing you have to do in life when you go on Blender Door, donate to Blender. <laughs> it seems to work. Um, then if you look at the far right uh, in, the, in the lower uh, part of the chart, so there is a little dip. So you can see it a little bit bigger here too, um, in terms of uh, the, uh, you know, still here on the left, on the, on the right side. And that's when we did the survey. So we replaced <laughs> the message with a message that said to people, we are doing a survey to collect some information from the Blender community. And the impact is pretty visible and devastating. So we ran the survey for a little bit and then we brought it back. But it just shows how pivotal that page is in a way, like in terms of the, the, the power of communication. This shows money. So you see like around 2,000 uh, one-time donations, 2,000 euros worth of uh, one-time donations. And uh, in terms of counts, we also can see it. And uh, you see it's an average of 80 one-time donations per day against the 47,000 downloads that we get. So the conversion rate there is 0.1%, which is like very little, which is kind of aligned with what Ton was saying in his keynote of you know, 90 plus percent of people, they do not donate. So like out of this conversion rate, there is a fraction of a fraction. Um, we can definitely, you know, that's what, what, when I think about ways to communicate and improve the communication on the website, if you manage to make the 0.2%, that's already massive. Some random stuff about uh, uh, usage, like how are people using Blender? So I always like to look at Steam because uh, uh, Steam is for playing games, but still people find Blender there. Blender is available on Steam, so you can download it, install it, and run it. And unlike the Blender project, we, they, you know, stores or places that distribute Blender, they don't have many columns about we are gonna track what you, what you are doing. So if you get Blender from any place, uh, they will make sure that they know when you are launching a software, how long you're using it for, and if you're using it for what, and so on. Um, so over the years, you can see how much adoption of Blender has grown. And uh, it is pretty convenient because these charts are public and easy to find online, and you can see the growing popularity. So there are almost 10,000 people at all times using Blender on Steam. So while we are sitting here, <laughs> so a room like this, but with like 10 times the people, everybody using Steam. So that's uh, everybody using Blender, like just on Steam. Um, another interesting uh, you know, aspect like to, to figure out like data usage, uh, a, a Blender usage is the Blender extensions platform, which we, uh, is available since Blender 4.2. And you can see the popularity also of some extensions. So a lot of modeling extensions are here. So you see there, are, there, are, there, there is stuff that is going into the you know, hundreds of thousands of downloads. So that shows that there is quite some uh, activity and people actually using Blender. I think at some point some of these tools could also be uh, added to Blender itself. Maintenance is very low in, this, uh, in these add-ons. Um, but what happened? Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I thought somebody was surprised. So, but from this platform, um, we can actually now, also for ourselves, for the Blender users that get Blender from Blender.org or anywhere, get some sort of a ping, some sort of a signal that you are at least launching Blender because you need to check for your extension download. Right? This is not a secret. This is something that we prominently explain when you enable the online access in Blender because that's the way we uh, do the, the check if there are extension updates or not. And this is since the launch of Blender 4.2, you see the growing adoption of the Blender 4.2 release over time. And so basically here, what it shows that we are hitting a peak of over 10,000 people 
launching Blender at least once every day. Um, these are still very early number. As time will pass, we're going to have a new release. And then it starts to become interesting because you see the overlap of people still using 4.2 with people using 4.3. And then this compounds, and it becomes bigger and bigger and becomes a big waterfall. And next year, I'm not going to do this next year. So, uh, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about development. Um, this is a chart also from the annual report that shows like the new and uh, active developers uh, since the beginning of time, since 2002. And, uh, where uh, towards, you know, in, in 2020, there was like really a, a, a rise into new developers joining the project with active developers obviously remaining there. Then there was a little bit of an, an inflection point, and now uh, the new developers are still uh, going up. This kind of chart becomes, it's quite tricky to do because it's done by parsing Git logs, aggregating information, people change names, people change uh, emails, and um, with more and more like PR oriented workflows, it also becomes a little bit more tricky to find out who committed what when. So, you know, it used to be much easier to do, uh, and now we have to find better methods to do this. Um, this is an overview of the uh, pull request approval time by committers versus non committers, so people that can just uh, technically straight commit data uh, into Blender without doing a pull request versus people that don't have commit access. And uh, you can see the distribution over time. So this is not obviously a linear scale. And uh, you can see that um, uh, uh, the, the, the time that it takes to get a uh, pull request approved is pretty quick. Like in, in a day or, or, or a week, like a lot of pull requests gets uh, approved. And uh, this is another, just talking about pull request is like the distribution of how by committers or non-committers uh, it's distributed. So around five pull requests per contributor. That's like very interesting because it means that people don't do one pull request and then run away. They do a little bit more. So it's uh, interesting data. And we start to measure these things. And then time is always the thing that makes it feel more like a story. So it's important to then keep measuring these things over time to see how they, uh, how they evolve. This is just more like a chart that shows the day-to-day, -day, more like the behind the scenes of how uh, we keep track of uh, open issues or untried reports and uh, try to keep things stable and management. This is a tool that the, um, that the Triagy team uses uh, quite a bit. And uh, more like into the community side, I wanted to show quickly, we uh, recently uh, created translate.blender.org, which is a portal for translating Blender. And this shows the translations for the manual. So you can see that some languages are very complete. Some languages are less complete. So you can see the communities that are very, very active. Slovak is more complete than English, actually. <laughs> so you got to be checking the accuracy of those dashboards. But you can see very, very active. Um, translation from the Blender UI is a similar, similar thing. Um, so these, to me, are all examples of uh, community efforts. And uh, speaking of community efforts, I want to start wrapping up with like one of my favorite, favorite charts of all times, which is the uh, issue response and resolution timings. So this is basically when you have a bug, when you have a problem in Blender, how long does it take to get it fixed? Well, here you have sort of an answer. So if you report an issue on the Blender.org website, um, you see that a, a big part gets resolved in less than a week. Like half of your issues get solved in half a week, in, in around a week. And the majority in a month, which is pretty impressive. It's very hard to find comparable numbers for other softwares. I always probe around and ask, but it's, dif it's difficult to measure as well. Like there is a lot of approximation, and you know, we do it. All the code that we use to make this is public. So you know, if people are interested in finding out how this works, they are, of course, welcome to verify this data. This is not uh, for marketing. Uh, but it's, it's difficult to find, and it's difficult to compare with other projects. But even better, the response, like the response is uh, amazing, because the majority of issues get a response within a day, which is, uh, you know, like if, if, as a user trying to get the support, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And this is the community, this is the triagers, this is everyone. Like, this is why we really always stress how important it is, like, that Blender is 
public, especially when it comes to the triaging and support, because a lot, there is a lot of push very often to find out, like, okay, can we have preferential treatment? Can we have a private uh, uh, place where we can do bug reporting? And then I usually show this kind of chart to really explain why this is important that it stays public and open for everyone, because then everyone can benefit from this. And uh, last week, as I showed you from the deep of the donations in Blender, we did a Blender survey. And uh, we are processing the data. I really wanted to uh, show a sneak peek here, but there wasn't enough time. We got like almost seven, above, uh, over 7,000 responses. Lots of interesting things that will come in a, a report properly formatted with nice uh, charts and data visualization. Um, so there is, uh, of course, like a lot of numbers uh, that, that we have available, and this is only like a little selection. And I, I wish to set up like a more formal framework and an infrastructure to handle and visualize and publish and share all this uh, data in the future as well. Um, I want to acknowledge a few people that helped, uh, helped me over the years uh, with this project. So thank you to Dalai, Falk, Ines, uh, Pablo, and Sergey, and everyone else that I forgot. Thank you very much.